I've been at Oregon Health and Science University for about five years. Uh, before I came to OHSU, I worked on the corporate side of scholarly content, um, dealing with content uh, creation, digitization, and distribution. Um, when I first joined OHSU, I was very much focused on what might be considered a uh, sort of more um, traditional focus on scholarly communication activities. So heavily involved with our repository, um, open access policies internally and externally and um, complying with those. Um, about two years ago, I actually transitioned into working within a scientific lab that's actually part of the library, which is our ontology development group. And it was there and because some sort of beginning activities and collaborations where my role um, sort of expanded and evolved to sort of take into account um, openness across uh, the uh, research cycle. So my short answer is that it's both the movement and practice of making research uh, freely available and maximally interoperable. So uh, within that, and depending upon the audience, I might go into these details or not, um, is that I think really the boundaries of it are debatable. So um, I wouldn't necessarily scold someone for dipping their toe in with just a sort of a component to, or one part of the research cycle. Um, but um, ultimately and optimally, um, it includes sort of all the products and all the processes that um, encompass a, um, a scientific inquiry and a scientific project. So that can include data, of course, articles, as we've long established, protocols, methodologies, and really an emphasis on sharing as often as possible and as soon as possible. If we're sort of to think about the um, sort of like open science as an, an uh, sort of an end state practice, it would, the emphasis would be on as soon as possible and as often as possible. And, and there you really sort of touch upon some of those um, earlier components of a um, research project. So um, methodologies and protocols and um, data as it is produced and analyzed. But I think if that we sort of, we can um, shoot ourselves in the foot a bit if we um, demand that sort of, um, um, uh, demand from researchers an endorsement of that, um, right off the bat. Open science um, drives discovery. Um, open science can uh, facilitate public engagement, um, and that's not only sort of public reuse of scientific research, but um, trust in the scientific process and science. Um, it can spur economic growth, um, and here at a biomedical research institution, an institution, a huge focus for us is how um, research translates into benefiting human health. So I think, um, you know, and there are um, sort of within each of those themes, there are ways in which that can positively impact the work of an individual, but also positively impact um, the work and mission of a research institution. Any other benefits that are top of mind? I think from the uh, perspective of the individual researcher or the individual science, scient or scientist, researcher, scholar, that um, openness is a way of ensuring that their work is more accessible. 
and their work is potentially, because of that, more impactful. Um, it also can help them uh, find collaborators and um, um, engage with communities outside of their discipline and outside um, research and academia. So um, it is a way of sort of um, uh, presenting and engaging with a um, more diverse uh, audience and communities uh, regarding their work and seeing and potentially a way to sort of, you know, not every scientist is a science communicator. Um, and I think that's an important um, reality. But at the same time, um, I think it is, we do have some responsibility to, uh, to ensure that um, our science isn't siloed. Um, and uh, open science is a tool for that. The biggest drawbacks in my mind are related to the transition costs. Um, there are new investments that need to be made in infrastructure, in skills, in workflows, and, and this is happening at a macro level. So if we're thinking about um, how funders uh, evaluate the research that they support, or how funders uh, reward certain behaviors of researchers and the research projects that they support. Um, there's currently a lot of change happening there, but more change is needed. Um, and then infrastructures to, um, to um, facilitate the kinds of benefits that open science is intended to facilitate. So, for example, um, repository infrastructures that um, allow data to be um, accessed, but it's uh, searchable, it's reusable, it's interoperable. Um, those are, um, there are technological advances and um, workflow um, investments and day-to-day um, -day work that needs to be done to uh, realize the benefits of the products of open science. Um, and that costs money. <laughs> um, so I think that that's not necessarily a drawback, but it's a reality of making that transition from sort of closed science to open science. Um, um, and those infrastructures, those workflows are what in, uh, in many ways needs to be we need to be in place and used to start um, demonstrating in full the benefits of open science. So in some ways, that's where I think a lot of the chicken and the egg problem is, is, is at, is uh, getting to the point where we have the um, infrastructures in place to realize not just open science, but the benefits of the products of open science. Many libraries, I think, are uh, managing this transition and attacking it with the introduction of new positions and initiatives that um, are focused on data management and data visualization and um, open access and intellectual property. Um, and those are important dimensions that we need to um, be able to be sort of experts at and, uh, and um, offer services and uh, education around. My experience at my library at Oregon Health and Science University is sort of wrestling with what, um, what sort of workflows and services and needs are sort of relate, are generalizable. So how can we talk about research data management practices and best practices 
in a way that um, addresses um, needs across disciplines and practices across disciplines. And when do we sort of at a level where um, domain specific knowledge is necessary? I think um, libraries and librarians, um, there's sort of two sets, two veins of, um, of knowledge that already many libraries are um, um, developing, but we also need to be focusing on and sort of um, learning. And uh, one sort of is this bucket of generalizable best practices and knowledge and expertise that relate to um, open science workflows and the um, practices and infrastructures that facilitate open science workflows. And yes, that is technological and it involves, for example, um, um, being able to um, at, le at the minimum sort of understand um, the um, uh, coding libraries that uh, scientists um, um, are using to um, 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 are transitioning away, for, for example, away from um, MATLAB to using Python for their uh, analyses and sharing their, um, uh, their data. Um, so being able to sort of understand those sort of technological and open source tools um, that can facilitate open science and reproducible research um, is one thing. Data management, uh, data visualization in terms of being able to effectively communicate your science. Um, but I also think, and I sort of spoke to this a moment ago, that there is a, as we sort of delve deeper um, and open science becomes the norm, I think there are also sort of um, domain specific uh, practices, domain specific concerns, domain specific uh, um, resources that need to be understood in order to um, um, fully realize um, open science in a specific lab or um, uh, uh, research setting. Um, and this is where um, at OHSU, for example, I think there's a real potential in libraries in general, a real potential to leverage the um, domain expertise of liaison librarians and the intimacy that they have with how um, the sort of educational and research environment of a specific subject or research area. Now, it probably requires answering and asking or asking and answering new questions about the activities and people and goals and practices within those domains. Um, but it's really just different questions, not necessarily an, a diff an entirely different model um, for um, delving into um, subject and domain specific knowledge. Um, but I do think sort of that knowledge is essential for um, um, really realizing open science practices in the context of a university, for example, in a um, uh, more than superficial way. And in a way that really becomes the norm and not um, something sort of I'm continually uh, advocating for, rather um, um, I'm implementing it. So, um, and I am not an intellectual property expert, so um, let me preface that. But I do think, especially as sort of, um, uh, and, and maybe it's um, helpful to um, look at this through a sort of, almost like a case study perspective. But that as, for example, as data sharing becomes more and more required and more and more the norm. Licensing, licensing, which is a component that drives interoperability, becomes more and more important. So if we are, for example, if a, if, if, um, a journal, for example, 
has a um, editorial policy which requires authors to share the data underlying their manuscripts. If there aren't guidelines and requirements for how that data can be reused by others, so licensing and reuse language, then when we sort of look farther down the pipeline and think about um, um, sort of uh, one research lab wanting to reuse that data, or in an even more complicated way, a research team wanting to reuse data from multiple repositories or from one repository with multiple contributors. If there aren't, if there are um, conflicting licensing attached to those data sets or licensing is unclear or there are um, reuse guidelines and um, restrictions that inhibit um, reuse without without sort of having to ask permission, then we aren't realizing what the open data was intended to provide. So uh, licensing is an important component of, um, of really driving the benefits of open science. Um, my, for example, um, my boss here at OHSU, and I think I mentioned that um, my position lives actually in a scientific lab uh, within the library. And my boss uh, leads a project called the Monarch Initiative, which is driven by um, hundreds of different data, um, data sets. So they're um, mining and using ontologies to relate and in, um, uh, query against hundreds of different data sets. Um, and while that project is um, immensely complicated, one of the biggest hurdles that they've encountered is not necessarily finding or accessing the data to drive their work, but navigating the licensing and reuse um, restrictions um, attached to those individual data sets. So um, in that sense, I think that um, intellectual property um, in terms of um, uh, really getting um, data producers and repository managers in tune with the um, licensing um, components and the language that facilitates the kind of reuse and interoperability um, that was um, is intended is um, is is as important as sharing the data itself open science is a is a means not the end Open science is intended to facilitate more transparent, more efficient, and more reproducible science. And I think in many ways to fix long-standing issues with the scientific enterprise, especially um, those that the digital age, so to speak, have made more, um, um, uh, more acute. So I think in that sense, if you know what, in what with open science as the norm, if we go back to sort of um, thinking about the infrastructures and the rewards and the workflows that um, uh, are a necessary component of that, I think they drive a way of working that is more collaborative. They drive a way of working that is more transparent. 
they drive a way of working that um, allows scientists to um, um, acknowledge failure sooner and to um, explore new paths of inquiry when necessary in a way that's um, uh, rewarded and not detrimental to their careers. Um, I also think it um, facilitates and sort of creates an environment where there is a um, more inclusive acknowledgement and um, celebration of uh, contributions where you know, even with a the open science movement uh, being as um, you know um, mature as it is, I mean, it's not a um, something that popped up yesterday. Um, we, you know, a science you know, papers, peer reviewed papers within science are really still the problematic currency of success, um, but. Even within a paper and outside of a paper, there are all kinds of contributions that um, that drive discovery that aren't acknowledged and aren't rewarded, and that can't be leveraged to make future work more successful. And they can't be discovered to make future work more successful. So, um, you know, I think. Um, contribution and expertise are really intertwined and making uh, uh, open science has the potential to make those um, um, uh, more um, discoverable and actionable.